Hi, this is BK for ManForWars.com and ManForWars Media, where I'm promoting polite patriotism to help nice ladies and gents worldwide offline teach kids to be and teach kids to look, talk, and feel great, and to help people worldwide locally discuss and share great info they find online, offline, as neighbors getting together, respecting each other, earning each other's respect, not just talking to like minds online, but connecting well over great information and making better people and better places to live and getting better politicians and better results by putting better politicians in as more informed and empowered people or by demanding more from your politicians and government than what you're typically told to accept. So uh, check out manforwars.com for more on that and see the links in the description below for uh, a plan to deal with this current COVID-19 coronavirus crisis today as well. And on that, um, this video is called Koch's Postulates. 100 years of science knowing what a virus is and now what COVID-19 is not. Koch's postulates. 100 years of, of science knowing what a virus is and now what COVID-19 is not. And um, this is inspired by about an hour and 20 minute video um, by uh, Dr. Uh, Thomas Cowan. Uh, and the last uh, half an hour or so of that video uh, is his wife, Asher Cowan, asking him questions from a Q&A. And it's on the High Impact Flicks BitChute channel. So I'll put a link to it below. I strongly recommend you check it out. Um, he's got a great measured style, right? He's talking like you'd expect a doctor to talk, not, you know, a highfalutin, you know, vlogger or pundit or whatever. He's talking like a medical doctor. And apparently he is one, uh, trained in the 80s um, and has been practicing ever since. And um, uh, he's got a great measured style, and he doesn't uh, talk about any conspiracy stuff. He doesn't talk about any causality stuff. Now, I think that stuff is important, because if there are people behind this thing who are profiteering off it and who are screwing people and who are treasonous and screwing their own people and selling them out and, and injuring or killing people, uh, I think that's really important. So I'm not against that at all. But um, when it comes to technically talking about this topic and when it comes to sharing information with, with, say, people that are not used to thinking there might be some bad people in power, um, you know, that there's, politicians might be corrupt, they might be lying, people who can't get that through their heads, right, and, and so on, um, or, or don't feel like it, they get their mantis or panties in a bunch, no problem. This great talk by Dr. Uh, Thomas Cowan with his wife's assistance um, is a great way to just so, sort of go, look, this is just a doctor, seems to be a good guy, he seems to know what he's talking about, and uh, he's trying to share his perspective on this. As a doctor, if you're going to listen to other doctors, you can always get a second opinion when it comes to major health decisions, even if it's a group of doctors. You can get a, a, a second opinion from another group of doctors, right? They say, you need surgery. It's like, but it's just a sore foot. You definitely need surgery. I want a second opinion. Surgery is a big deal. Well, so is this COVID-19 pandemic or coronavirus crisis that we're all experiencing. So it's good to get a variety of things to do besides wash your hands, stay away from people and stay home. It's like, is there anything else we should know about this or do about this? No, you're the top doctors in the world. Yeah, what about vitamin C, vitamin D? What about zinc? What about quinine, tonic water or hydroxychloroquine with zinc? Or what about, uh, you know, this dewormer drug? Or what about vitamin A? What about the body's immune response, the cytokine reactions? What? No, 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 no. Wash your hands, stay away from people, stay home. And that's the best we can do. Well, look, doctor. I think we can do better than that. And Dr. Thomas Cowan will help us understand that from a deeper perspective. Um, and I don't know this dude, but I've seen other stuff like this. And this seems credible. And a high impact flick seems like a good patriotic uh, dude in the U.S. who usually does good work. So you add it all up and then you think for yourself, right? At least you got different things to think about so you can and you can help other people do the same. Um, but I want to I want to kind of uh, break down some of the basics of this to sort of inspire people to take a look at it because it is a significant investment in time, and uh, and I think it can significantly help um, if we either see it or if we can digest it and if we can share in a variety of ways kind of the major points from it, right? Um, so even though it's technical, right, and he apologizes, but he's a doctor. He's like, I, I have to say this stuff somewhat technically, but I'll try and be, you know, I speak to lay people too, so he can do both. Um, but I think most people will get about 90% of it. I think most people will get about 90% of what this guy's talking about. If you're a little bit sharper, if you're one of the sharper knives in the Christmas tree or whatever the hell that saying is, you might get 95%. If you're a less sharp knife in the Christmas tree or whatever the hell that saying is, you might get 80%, 85%. But either way, you'll definitely benefit or people you know will benefit 
and it will help you understand science better. Science better, right? And as I say in a, a song of mine called Party in the Dot, sex is the religion of the masses. Science is the religion of the upper classes, right? And uh, when uh, a lot of people in power tend to want to use science to say it's science, you have to believe this science, you have to believe uh, global warming, I mean global cooling, I mean climate change, I mean science, science, science. Or you have to believe the COVID-19 virus is going to kill millions of people. Or maybe not really. We're going to need thousands, millions of ventilators. Well, maybe not really. We're going to need this and that. Well, maybe not really. You have to stay six feet apart. No, 27 feet apart. No, you can't see your family or friends again. You just It's too dangerous. We have to go into your house. If, you, if you're if you nervous and you have a temperature and you're sweating, you, we have to take you away. For, maybe because you're coming to my house, right? So, um, so it helps to understand science better right? The pros and the cons of science better, right? And there's no such thing as settled science. When someone says this is settled science, there is no settled science. Science is a constant process of discovery. So if people uh, who are who are saying, well, this is settled science, this is the way it is, right? And, and they are against, you know, people uh, coming up with different ideas, coming up with different hypotheses, trying to test and verify those hypotheses, then they're liars. They're in service of, of, of whoever, right? If people are like, nope, the only thing we can do is wait for a vaccine. It's like, we can't take vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin D, vitamin C. You know, since I was a kid, they said vitamin C for a cold or flu. Nope, just a vaccine. It's like, no, that, that's not settled science either, right? So there are there are there there is corruption in, in the scientific field and we need to expose that now. Otherwise that corruption will be used to bully everyone into going along with it and, and worse, right? Could we go from, you know, a flu pandemic and quarantine to uh, a live organ harvesting uh, that's happening apparently on an organized fashion in communist China? Well, depends on how corrupt you let your medical system get. So we got to push back on that in a variety of ways. Um, <clears throat> so that's the first point is that uh, good talk, good doctor, get most of it and understand science better so you're not bullshitted by people who use science. You got experts, we got experts. You get us all panicked, we learn a lot. People come up with a lot. People work hard, right? People who are experts, people who are people who can understand experts because they're not stupid. The same people that go for a second opinion from doctors. What's like, well, I'm a doctor, do what I say. Well, hold on, doctor, that's a pretty big decision. I want to hear another doctor, right? So it's perfectly normal to do that, especially at this time with the sort of big decisions going on related to the coronavirus crisis. So <clears throat> the second point is about Koch's postulates. Koch's postulates, right? Um, this is a hundred years old and yet it's accepted right now. Could they improve on it? Sure. Have they? No. This is the way to test if there really is a virus that's causing a problem. If it is a foreign organism that's normally not in your body and somebody sneezed or something happened and it flew from their snot and you breathed it and now this thing that was never in your body before is in your body and it's causing problems, right? That is how they prove it's actually a virus. It's something foreign to your body that shouldn't be there. And it's it's in your body and you're unlucky enough to have it. And we have to do something to neutralize it and get rid of it and help your body develop antibodies to it, right? And um, so Koch's postulates is the accepted way of doing it, right? Um, now, there are four accepted rules for more than 100 years to prove that the virus exists and the cause and effect, right? So, um, you know, I'll expand on this a bit from, from Dr. Thomas Cowan's talk, plus stuff I've learned over, over several years. But I look up Koch's postulates, and you can see the spelling in the title of this video, uh, K-O-C-H, right? Um, and, uh, and, and Wikipedia is kind of crapping on it. There's Wikipedia, and there is a shot of Koch's postulates and Robert Hermann Koch, right? And uh, was a German phys physician, and it says here, four criteria designed to establish a causative relationship between a microbe and disease, formulated by Robert Koch and Friedrich Loeffler in 1884, based on earlier concepts described by uh, Jakob Heinle, refined and published by Co Coach, uh, Koch in 1890. He applied them to describe the etiology of cholera and tuberculosis, but they've been controversially generalized to other diseases, and I'll get into that in a second. And, um, and so on. So... Wikipedia starts obscuring Koch's postulates, and you can you can decide for yourself, you know, how right or wrong it is. In the Wikipedia article itself, they don't even list the postulates. 
because the postulates make too much sense. What they do is say, well, this is controversial. Some people believe in them, some people don't. Some people diagnose diseases and viruses a different way, right? And I'll get into why that is a uh, mistake relative to what we know so far. Although, like I said, no settled science. So, um, so um, you know, it can be improved on. It just hasn't been yet. So, uh, you know, I, I found a decent explanation, very simple, that just kind of lays them out from uh, Britannica.com, the legendary Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, I may be dating myself, but I think I'm worth it. Um, but I do recall that there was a time when the Encyclopedia Britannica was delivered to, uh, to houses um, around the world. And instead of having the Internet, you'd get these giant books um, that didn't change and that couldn't just be deleted and that had a whole bunch of information in there uh, about the world. Right, so that's the Encyclopedia Britannica, right? And so it says here from Britannica.com, right? And there it is. And I'm not saying believe these people 100% either, but at least they give you the basics when it comes to this sort of history of this, from what I can tell. It says here, uh, Koch, now recognized as a scientific investigator of the first rank obtained a position in Berlin in the Imperial Health Office, where he set up a laboratory in bacteriology. With his collaborators, he devised new research methods to isolate pathogenic bacteria. Koch determined guidelines to prove a disease is caused by a specific organism. These four basic criteria called Koch's postulates are, and again, this is key, caused by a specific organism. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been outside when it's been a little cold outside, and I've felt a little cold outside, and then I've walked inside, or I, my nose has started running, and I've blown my nose, and I've been fine, right? Playing basketball recently before all quarantine lockdown, and it's cold outside, but you're still trying to dress a little warmish, and you're trying to shoot hoops, and all of a sudden your nose is running a bit. Now, is that caused by something outside, or is that my own body going, cold, buddy, what are you doing out here? I'm trying to keep warm, run around. All right, but you got a little cold, body got a little screwed up, you're going to poop out some snot. Yeah, sure, sure. Wink, gone, right? As opposed to virus got you. That's why it's happening, right? So <clears throat> these are uh, the four basic criteria called Koch's postulates. Number one, a specific microorganism is always associated with a given disease, right? That means this specific microorganism, like not just any coronavirus, because there's many coronaviruses, um, COVID-19 could be a name for this specific one, or SARS-CoV-2, or whatever, right? And you can't trust all that and all those studies because big virus, big pharma, big research, big whatever could just say whatever to get lots more money to deal with whatever. And so there's a lot of stuff out there you can't just trust. You can't say, oh my God, I heard it's four different viruses stitched together with an HIV delivery system, like Alex Jones has said because some big virus researchers said that. And I like Jones. I like the InfoWars team. I think they do a lot of great work. I, man to man, would disagree with him to his face on this. And we could argue like men uh, and we could we could settle on respecting each other's difference of opinion uh, or, or and, and evolving our own and improving it, perhaps, right? But, but a lot of that stuff could just be put out there, right? Or the virus doesn't just spread six feet. It actually spreads 27 feet. We're not social distancing enough, right? It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Qui bono, Q-U-I-B-O-N-O, -O, Latin for who benefits. Who benefits from putting this out, right? That's important to understand. So Koch's postulates is a good way to say, wait a second, wait a second. Instead of just assuming it's here and doing all this, did we really prove it, right? So the four are, number one, a specific microorganism is always associated with a given disease. That means this virus causes these symptoms, which means you have this disease, right? It's this little wriggly thing, not normally in your body, but we, we, there it is. And it's in you now. And it always does this to human beings or animals or whatever. It always does. It looks like this. It always does this. If it comes into your body, it'll do what it did to that guy. So, you know, we got to worry about that, right? So that's number one. Number two, the microorganism can be isolated from the diseased animal and grown in pure culture in the laboratory. This is important. That means they can't just take a bunch of biomatter. You cut your finger, a bunch of blood comes out, there's a bunch of crap in there, right? Or you look inside the human body, there's a whole bunch of biomatter in there. But what they're, what Koch's postulates say is the second postulate, the microorganism can be isolated from the diseased animal and grown in pure culture in the laboratory, which means we can say, okay, we found this little wriggly thing, you know, it's isolated, right? It, we're proving it's alive and it's messing with you, right? It's not just like a splinter or it's not just like a piece of dust, 
it's a virus. It's a wriggly little virus. It's like the coronavirus with all those little, you know, like a crown with all those little things poking off its head, right? So we can take that thing and we can put it in a pure culture, in this culture of, you know, bi biological material that can sustain its life. And then we can grow it in there. And we could say, yep, we pulled it out of your body. We isolated the specific one that shouldn't be there. We put it in this pure culture and we tested it and there it is. It's alive and it's wriggling around. And it's trying to eat this normal human biological or animal biological material. That's what it's doing. That proves it's there, right? So that's the second one. And number three, the cultured microbe will cause disease when transferred to a healthy animal, right? Which means if we take this microbe, which we pulled out of someone, right? We put it in a pure culture. It's still there. It's alive. It's wriggling. It's a virus. It wants to, to attack people and attack your immune system and mess up your body and give you, you know, flu-like symptoms or whatever, right? It will cause the same thing when transferred to a healthy animal or a healthy human, right? If you take the same virus and it's supposed to do to me and every other human or do to that horse or that chicken or that dog or that cow, what it does to every other human, horse, chicken, dog, or cow, then, all right, all right, that's the virus. That's what it is. That's what it does, right? But it has to do that. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense, right? And then number four, that same type of microorganism can be isolated from the newly infected animal. So you take the virus, you pull it out, right? And you can do this as a researcher, right? You can do this as a scientist. You can say, okay, we, um, we, 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 this, this animal is, this, this dog is showing symptoms or this monkey is showing symptoms, right? So we have pulled it out. We isolated it and we put it in a pure culture. We verified it's there. We took it and we put it back into another animal, either by, you know, uh, having the animal sneeze and then putting the, a, a bag with that animal after it sneezed in it over another animal's head, like one horse. <laughs> Oh my God. And then you take the same bag full of horse knot and you make another horse wear it and that's how it, it gets it. <clears throat> or you could inject the virus into another animal and it should do the exact same thing, right? Because, <clears throat> because that proves that's the virus and that's exactly what that virus does to animals or humans. So these are Koch's postulates. in a nutshell. And you can look into that more for yourself as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, um, as, um, as, 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 as Dr. Um, as Dr. Cowan said, um, they had some real issues when it comes to, uh, polio and other epidemics, um, back in the, um, in the early 1900s, right? Because they wanted to say, right. And there's a couple of theories. There's Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, who came up with the virus theory, later on his deathbed, he recanted. He was like, I've made a lot of money and, 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 and I did a lot of bad, but God, please save me. I was actually wrong about the virus germ theory, you know, and, you know, before he died, you know, like he wants to be religious time, he wants to be forgiven by God after making a lot of money off a of bullshit theory, you know, to help big pharma sell drugs, right? Um, because then you need drugs. This is coming from outside your body. This is how we test for it. We can do a lot of weird medical stuff and you need these drugs to beat that as opposed to, no, no, you just need to be healthier. There's Pasteur, Louis Pasteur versus Beauchamp, B-A-U-C-H-A-M-P, who said, no, 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 it's not that. It's that you do get stuff from outside your body that messes you up, like toxins, like smoke, like carcinogens, like, you know, bad food, like rotten this, like so-and-so that, and that screws you up. But if you eat better, your body will kick its ass as opposed to the actual different virus needs different medical drug, right? So Pasteur and Beauchamp were arguing in like the late 1800s. And because big pharma could make money by selling drug, you don't, you, the drug foreign to your body to deal with virus foreign to your body. Boom. Right. That's how that was promoted. Whereas Beauchamp was like, no, no, there's all sorts of stuff. Your body's living today. We know your body's full of bacteria, full of viruses, full of hundreds of different, different or millions of millions of different, millions of different organisms. Right. And, um, and it's always dealing with stuff. You walk outside your house, right? You eat a can of food. It's got monosodium glutamate. It's got uh, artificial color. It's got sugar. It's got all sorts of stuff your body's got to deal with, 
right? So, so, but hey, Pasteur won, here we are. And even though he recanted later, um, you know, it's, it's not something that's promoted much, right? But in the, in the, in the early 1900s, uh, uh, some of the big kind of pharma people were trying to push the German virus theory. And so they got two monkeys, right? And they got this monkey that had, you know, polio-like symptoms, right? And so they were like, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna make this monkey sneeze on that other monkey. But the other monkey didn't get sick, right? And this is Dr. Thomas Cowan saying this in a smarter way than I am. I'm kind of dumbing it down for me and for you and encouraging you to watch the, the, le the lengthy video if you'd like. But, <clears throat> or, the, you know, this is a pretty good pricey, a pretty good summary, right? Um, and, 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 and he says, they tried to, 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 to make this monkey that was sick make that monkey sick, and it didn't work, right? So then they were like, okay, we'll take some blood from this monkey, which obviously has a virus in it, and we'll put that blood into the other monkey. And the monkey still didn't get sick. So what they did was they were like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to drill holes in these two monkeys' heads, and we're going to take some biological goo from the sick monkey, and we're going to shove it into the holes in those heads, right? So they're going to drill a hole in this monkey's head. We're going to take this sick, sick monkey. It obviously has something wrong with it, right? But we're going to scoop out a bunch of its junk, and we're going to shove it into the holes in these monkeys' heads, which we drilled, right? What happened to those two monkeys? One died, the other got paralyzed. They say, ah, see, the polio virus is paralyzing people. Everybody needs a polio vaccine, right? That's how they launched polio, right? And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What about drilling the holes in those monkeys' heads? What about taking a bunch of gunk from another monkey and shoving it into their heads? It's like, yeah, one died, see? The virus is deadly. The other one got paralyzed. If the virus is not deadly, it's really dangerous. So this is what you need, right? So Dr. Thomas Cowan um, explains that in his more uh, professional way, right? Um, and, uh, and, 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 and he says, right, um, going into a bit of his background, he says that he went to medical school in the 80s, right? And, um, and you know, 40 years ago, um, he says, we were wrong about bacteria being bad or all bacteria being bad. So we used, you know, antibacterial agents or, you know, whatever. And, uh, and we killed all the bacteria. We said, we have to kill all the bacteria in a human's body because all bacteria is bad. And what happened? They killed people. Patients died. They're like, oh my God, you've got bacteria in you. Now we know these days there's good bacteria. There's gut bacteria, helps you digest. Your body's practically mostly bacteria, according to some understandings of things, right? Um, you know, you know, more bacteria than blood cells, for example, I've heard, but whatever, all this stuff is out there. But the point is, he's going through his own history. He's saying in the 80s, we thought all bacteria was bad. So we have to destroy all the bacteria in a person's body. And then even the good bacteria couldn't help them fight any bad things that were happening in their body or any toxins they were taking in. So we killed people, right? And then he says, um, when it comes to cancer, we thought we've got to destroy these cancer cells with super strong radiation because these cancer cells are so bad, right? Not improving your body's ability to fight them, but attacking your body with radiation to, because to really destroy these cancer cells. And what do we do? We killed people. Right, and you can see the video for his more um, his more uh, detailed explanation. Right, and he says, and we were wrong about HIV. Right, we're wrong about HIV, the disease that caused AIDS. Now, 40 years later, AIDS. Where's AIDS? In, in the 80s, it was going to kill all of us, gay, straight, whatever. Right, but since then, eh, just kind of went away. They still have big campaigns. They've got celebrities out there. They've got benefit concerts. They raise lots of money. They've got the red ribbon campaign. They've got red clothing you wear. Right. And they've got all these celebrities. We're going to beat AIDS in Africa one day. So AIDS in Africa? Africa has mostly Muslim and Christian countries. Africa has mostly Muslim and Christian people. They're not fucking each other like we are. Here in atheistic, communistic Canada or America or the West, where, yeah, there's a lot of religious people. There's a lot of not religious people. And there's a lot of Tinder and dating apps and divorces and people going out to bars and shagging strangers. And not all of them are practicing, quote unquote, safe sex. And even if they are, how safe is that sex in many cases, right? So there should be AIDS all over the place in the West. Why is it not AIDS all over the place in the West? Why, for the last 30 years, it's only been AIDS all over Africa? Why? Because they, they don't isolate the virus and test for the virus. They test for related genetic material. And if you have acquired immune deficiency syndrome, it means you acquire an immune deficiency, which means you could just be malnourished. You could just be malnourished. That's all. Your immune system's weak. Your white blood cell count's low. 
and they assume there's an HIV virus there. If you take the same test in the West, you got to get nine out of 10, uh, for example, um, to, to be diagnosed as AIDS. If you take it in Africa, you got to get five out of 10. And then they use, they, they use drugs like AZT banned in the 1970s for killing people. Um, they bring it back as an AIDS drug. And then if you survive it, look, it worked. If it killed you, hey, you had AIDS. People die from AIDS. What'd you expect, right? So a lot of corruption involved in that, right? And um, and Thomas Cowan himself says, when it comes to HIV, he doesn't go into it in a lot of detail, but when it comes to HIV, um, and he mentions theinfectiousmyth.com, theinfectiousmyth.com, as one of a few good sources at the beginning of the video to say, if you want to you know, look at all this stuff before you ask me questions, do that first. And then if you still have questions, happy to ask. Otherwise, this is a lot of quality stuff. And that's a website run by David Crow, D-A-V-I-D-C-R-O-W-E, who I interviewed many years ago on my radio show, who went through the whole thing, AIDS can't be found or cured. David Crow has a simple explanation. You can look up that interview on the internet. You can download it. It's evergreen because it's the same thing. And there are thousands of scientists that expose this, but they're typically ignored by the mainstream media, even the patriot media, independent media, because, you know, might be too far out there, just like a lot of other uh, uh, groups of experts are on different issues from people questioning climate change to architects and engineers for 9-11 truth and so on, right? And you don't have to believe all this stuff, but do know that there are many experts that knew this, that saw this as bullshit, that didn't want to see them killing people in the West or killing people in Africa on a systemic organized basis, and they have spoken out and they should not be ignored, right? And ignoring that stuff leads us here with uh, a coronavirus crisis, confusion, martial law, quarantines, and who knows when this will end or if our lives will ever be the same again. So it's good to get all this stuff out there, help people think for themselves, and then and then discuss these things as polite, patriotic people who respect each other on and offline uh, to, to come up with the best answers, right? And if it's stupid, laugh, smart, enjoy. That's that. Um, but, so Dr. Thomas Cowan says, um, they test for antibodies, right, to prove the virus exists when it comes to HIV, right? And he says, he says, as a young medical doctor, I was like, wait a second, I thought antibodies meant you were immune, meant you were immune from a disease, right? You have the antibodies, which means your body has already figured out a way to fight it. So why does that mean now mean you have it, right? That's basically what they want to do with the coronavirus. They want to test everybody and say, well, yeah, you may have got it at some point, but you know, because you've got the antibodies, it means that you had it and your body beat it. And so now you're immune to it because your body is used to that specific virus. And, and so, you know, it means you beat it. So that's good, right? And so, because you already have the antibodies to beat it, even if it comes back, unless it mutates like crazy and then something else comes back or whatever, you know, whatever. But, but, but he's saying, we used to say, if you have the antibodies to something, it meant you're, you, you got affected or infected with it, then your body fought it off. It built up a resistance to it, like chickenpox, for example, right? Chickenpox, if you had chickenpox, you don't get chickenpox again, right? They say that. The kids have chickenpox parties, whatever, whatever, right? Um, and so, but now you're saying, when it comes to HIV and other viruses out there, you're saying if they do have antibodies, it means they do have it and they are sick with it. So what, what are you talking about, right? So he says, I can't tell as a medical doctor whether having antibodies means you're immune from something or whether having antibodies means you have something and need to start a dangerous cycle of drugs and ventilators and treatments and blah, 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 blah. Because it used to mean, yeah, you had something and your body figured out how to beat it and now you're cool and you're immune to it because your body is familiar with it and, and can fight it off consistently. Now it's like, no, you have the antibodies. That means you must have it. So they don't even test for the actual virus itself. They test for related materials, including antibodies they say are related to it, right? Um, and um, so finally, you know, he's got uh, other interesting ideas, you know, in his video, right? And he speaks on them from an authoritative perspective. Uh, but he basically says, try and avoid poisons. Try and avoid poisons in food, poisons in your environment, poisons, you know, uh, you know, uh, everywhere, poisons from say 5G cell tower radiation or, or, you know, normal cell phones, try not to hold it up to your head, try and use a, 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 a you know, a, a speaker phone or use an earpiece, which might help, right? Try and avoid poisons, right? And also he says, 
Don't take this to mean you should be obnoxious and you should wander around sneezing on people or you should wander around licking things that people sneezed on or sucking on, you know, used Kleenexes like they're lollipops. No, that's not what, that's not what this means, right? We should all be respectful of each other and respectful of how each of us feels about these sort of things and optimistic and hopeful for the future and try and be a decent person. And he says that what happens is your body's response, just like if you get a splinter, and you get a bunch of pus, and that pus is there, and that pus starts forming. It's all the white blood cells, it's all the whatever. It's trying to literally push that splinter out, right? It's trying to, it'll start forming and bubbling on your finger, and it'll squeeze, and instead of using tweezers to pull it out, which you can do, obviously, your, your body will try and, you know, squish it out. It's like this splinter is foreign. This piece of wood is not supposed to be in my body. So my body's trying to squeeze and push it out as well as attack what it's doing and how it's making you sick. So that's a foreign thing, right? And so when it comes to that and when it comes to other reactions, other symptoms, other flu-like symptoms, <coughs> cough, could be anything, <coughs> sneezing, running nose, uh, temperature, uh, uh, right? All those things, they could be diagnosed a number of different ways. They could be diagnosed as coronavirus, especially if they get a lot of money for it. If they get, say, $14,000 for every positive test, like they do in places in the US, or 40,000 if it's really bad and you need a ventilator, right? Um, you know, so there's corruption in there and they could diagnose these symptoms as the current COVID-19 coronavirus because they make money off it and that corrupts the system and then it could screw us even more later, right? Um, but he says, irrespective of that, he says, what happens is when you do that, when you do have some toxins in your body, right? Like when you're, you know, you're, you're walking on a, on a dusty day, a, a, a day where there's a lot of pollen, dust in the air. You're in a place where there's a lot of car smoke. You're downtown in an urban center and there's cars are belching from their exhaust pipes, this stuff, and you breathe it in, right? Your body starts fighting that stuff that's not supposed to be in your body. It's, 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 you know, foreign to your body. It's not good for you. And so you basically poop it out. You poop it out one way or another. You can poop it out by literally pooping it out. You can poop it out by peeing it out. You can poop it out by sweating it out, right? And those are good ways to get rid of toxins, right? And you can poop it out by sneezing it out or by coughing it out, you can be like, <coughs> <coughs> right? Or just walk by, you know, a, you know, a, 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 a construction site dust blowing everywhere, blah, 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 blah. Then you go, you know, you know, you leave half a block later, your nose is running and you're like, <clears throat> you know, blowing it out. When I was in India, right? For some parts of India, I'd blow my nose and the snot was black. It was black. That's how much crap there was in the air, right? So he says, when it comes to social distancing or washing your hands or the typical things we've been recommended, he says, it's not a good idea to eat other people's poop, right? So if someone is sneezing something out, even if they're not sneezing out a virus, they're sneezing out some shit that their body uh, uh, decided was, was not good for it, was foreign to it, and is trying to get out of it. So even if there's not a virus in that snot, it's still some other poop from some person, variation on a theme, which you should not be uh, digesting and absorbing anyway. So. You shouldn't be sneezing on people. You shouldn't be this. You should be laughing because this thing might be a, a, a overblown hoax in many ways, right? You shouldn't be doing that. Um, but, you know, you, you shouldn't be also thinking it's totally safe to have somebody go, ah, chew in your face and go, ah, because it's just crap that their body, you know, tried to get out of it, which is not good for it, which is now crap that is in your body that you have to try to get out of it as well. So there is a certain sensible nature to this, even if a lot of it is a hoax. Um, and there you go. Um, so I'll leave it there for now. Uh, I'll put a link to this this video below. And uh, a lot of this info is censored, but hopefully, um, you know, my analysis helps and gives you kind of a lay person's perspective on, on what's going on. And if you want to look at the more technical details, again, check out Dr. Thomas Callen's video below on the High Impact Flicks BitChute channel. Otherwise, um, uh, uh, BK from Manforwars.com, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, uh, get in touch with questions, answers to work together, financial support. Um, see uh, the description below for more information on what to do today about this crisis, uh, what we did to beat swine flu back in the day and what can still work today wherever it can, or at least versions of it, share best patriot practices around the world so we can all kind of uh, make better uh, people and places to live. Um, and otherwise, 
I hope this helps and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Cheers.